All right, everybody, welcome to the podcast where it's closing. Hi, I'm Elder Blaine T. Man. I am your host tonight as we're going to rock and roll and get in some really juicy areas tonight. First, I want to thank everybody for showing up, showing out, and all my patrons and all my sponsors. Don't remember to give me stars. Remember to like, remember to subscribe, and remember to go to my YouTube channel, which will be in the comments later on. And we're going to talk about uh, some issues tonight that I believe is going to be helpful for your life in Christ and in your marriage, right? So tonight, topics are going to be, one, we're going to just talk about marriage in general. So that's one of the things God placed in my heart, to get some wisdom about marriage. Because getting wisdom and understanding is the principal thing. How to apply wisdom to your relationship. Because let's face it, some of our relationships are jacked up. Areas. It might not be all of it, but it's, it's enough to call you to get on your knees and pray. And so I know God has some wisdom for you tonight. And he's going to clear up some areas. I know that for sure. God been ministering to me for days and days and days since the last podcast. And just going over his scripture. Going over his word. So that's tonight. Then tonight, we're also going to talk about the dissension of your sex life. Why your sex life diving down instead of going up. Y'all started a good race. <laughs> Isn't that what the Bible says? Y'all started a good race. But now, and then he said Galatians. Who foolish Galatians? Who has bewitched you? And who has cut in on you as far as your relationship and sexuality with you and your husband? And remember, here's my disclaimer. This is not for singles. But you can think about it, right? When I talk about sex, I don't want you to go out crying out with your bo- your boyfriend. So that's one thing we, we want to get that clear. And then also we're going to talk about your finances and why you are still broke. Or put it this way, you look into your wallet, there ain't nothing there. And you want to know. And now ask yourself, have you ever asked yourself, where did the money go? Where is my money? <laughs> I'm working, I'm working. I got a somewhat of a budget in my head, but why am I still struggling? Where is my money going to? And we're going to talk about that because we know that in your relationship, in your marriage, with your family, the key point, the key point is communication, sex, finance. Now say that with me. Communication, sex, and finances because everything else out of that comes to many rivers and tributaries that affect marriages, that affect your life. And so God just placed in my heart that, you know, we just need somebody to just talk about these things openly with transparency. And let's go ahead and, and get this stuff. Why are the body of Christ so, so, so fearful about the thing that God made, right? God made communication. God said, let there be light. Communication. God said, let me create man and then create woman. Sexual content. And God said, go and be fruitful and multiply. Finances. That's it. That's it. And so so we want to talk about these things. And we want to see what the scripture says on it. And we don't want to put a religious cloak on it. Also, stay with me all the way through. Because I got a special offer for everyone out there who, who hangs and hang, hangs tight. Again, my name is Blank C. Van. And welcome to uh, Word Explosion. Also. Uh, I tell you, sometimes I see your comments and sometimes I don't. And so tonight, it's not open mic, but you can go ahead and do your comments. I know sometimes people have a hard time doing the comments on my YouTube page. And some say that you have to be a subscriber. And so I know that for that a fact, that probably be it. So go to my YouTube page, subscribe, you can make comments. On Tuesday night, it's open mic night. On Tuesday night. So I really want you to think about that. Because I'm going to let you know the topics I'll be talking about on Tuesday. And on this particular streaming service, I can have up to 10 guests. And any topic that I'm talking about, you can get on and we can talk about it. And you can be live. So get your makeup right. Get your lighting right. Don't be no avatars, right? And um, come with a good heart and come with respectability. And then we can talk about some of the topics I talk about. You can ask questions about your marriage about your, your children, about, about work and, and relationship. Now, I'm not saying I have all the answers. God has all the answers. Amen. But I found out that if you can take something that's concerning you and put it into a, a question, 
and articulate it in the coming forth of that. And I'm just being a vessel. God will give you clear insight. God will give you answers. God talks to his people. Contrary to popular atheistic beliefs, God speaks to his people. And he speaks to his people through the word. He speaks to his people to people through movies, God speaks to his people through nature. So if you want the people like to get up early and take a walk and see the sunset or the sunrise, if you can just just tune, it's like a, a radio. If you can just tune it just a little, a little to the left, to the right, you will hear God's voice so clearly. Can I get an amen? You will hear it, and God is in the business of solving naughty problems. God can give you the revelation for your granddaughter, the revelation for your daughter, your child, the situation with your parents. Do you take them to a nursing home? Do they stay with you? Do I sell this house? Do I sell this stock? Do I buy this car? Why this land? Should, should I wear these boots to work? I mean, God is right there through the Holy Spirit to aid us and to keep us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the night. Thank you for your word of closing. May your word have free force in our life, God. And may we Get to the birthing position to receive wisdom from on high. In Jesus' name. And everybody say what? Amen and amen. So tonight, I want to talk to you about marriage just a little bit. And because I have some friends of mine that's going through in the marriage, right? And I had this question. See if this could be written for home. And here's my question. How can two Christians who love the Lord get divorced. You understand? How can two people that confess to Jesus go to church, even, sit underneath the word, yet end up divorced? Have you ever wondered about that? If you have, say, yeah, I have. Put it in the comments, right? And so that's the question that I've been asking the Lord for years, for years. And then I, I kind of slack off it just a little. And then one of my friends end up divorced, or household gets split up, children get separated, land gets sold, house gets sold, and then that question bobbles right up. And I ask, are you a Christian? Are you a Christian? Yes, we're Christian. How can two Christians get divorced? Now, I can see two Hebrews, right? I can see that. I can see a Christian and a Hebrew. I, I just couldn't get how two Christians could. And then the Lord just began to speak to me. And I mean, my wife, we're both Christian, right? And because we're both Christian, I'm saying, are we going to fall underneath that? Are we pray for divorce? What can I do as a husband so we never get divorced? How can I divorce proof my house? How can I do that? What do I have to do? Because, and I say, God, this was a man of God, taught Bible school, taught Bible study. She taught Bible study. She did the children. She did the youth. And they ended up divorced. I was like, what the heck, man? Really? And it bothered me. I said, God, this is a problem. This is a problem. And so I had to come more tonight that saying it's a problem because we know that it is, right? And I know that if you took a survey right now where everybody was watching, 60% of you guys got divorced. 60%. That's a high number. And I'm like, so God, what can you do for us to help us understand? Again, God can speak to me. So let's just talk about marriage just a little bit. Then I want to show you some things. And then I got to show you some keys to unlock this thing so that from tonight on, your marriage get better. And I don't care, where is it at? Because remember, this 30 fold. Come on, stay with me. I'm going to keep repeating the same thing 30 fold, 60 fold. What comes up there? 100 fold. And is it possible that you and your husband, or you, husband, and your wife, walk in a 100 fold marriage? Is it possible? Is it something that God wants us to do? Is it possible that you can enter into the joy of it, the joy of marriage, this elusive thing? And let me tell you, the reason why I know we can, because the whole mystery of the kingdom of God 
and the mystery of marriage is Christ and the church. The mystery of marriage is Christ and the church. And so if you out there right now and you're not even a believer, right, I'm glad that you're here, right? Because I believe my podcast is just not for Christians. I believe my podcast is for the homosexual, transgender, thieves, rapists, terrorists, evil folks, homeless folks. Because Jesus was out for the whole world. And he didn't specify just this religious group up here. It was the religious group that kicked him out. And I know that the answer that God has for all of us in this area of marriage is going to affect everybody's life. Is that important? Right? Communication, sex, finance. You, you, you got those three. If you get those three down, all the rest of your fruit in your life would be solid. And I can say that in my life, it's solid. Now, I work, I work like a dog. I, I'm serious. I work like a dog, man. Head in my hand going, my God, what, what can I do to please this woman? <laughs> what, can I, what can I do? And every time I went to the Lord, he kept pointing back at me. Every time I pointed at her, man, look, no fingers pointing back at me, which I did not like at all. But now I'm used to it. But in the beginning, I didn't like that. I didn't like, I go like this, and I try to blame my wife, and I got three fingers back at me. And I was like, what did I do? What did I do? I didn't do nothing. I'm doing the best I can. And so that's one of the things. So let's talk about marriage. Marriage is instituted by God. Marriage is developed by God. God wants men and women to come together and form a union. That's what God did. He wanted to both come together and he wanted to live in harmony. That's the Lord idea. That's not Satan's idea. It didn't come from the earth. If you study marriage, it even predates Christianity. And you say, well, how can it be God? Because in the beginning it was God. See, a lot of folks, when they go to the history, studying this stuff, they say, look, the Babylonians have marriage. And they had naming all these ancient civilizations of marriage. And they said because it was before the time of Jesus, they believed God was not involved. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. And his word was to have a people unto himself that had come together of their own free will. So marriage should be of your own free will. Can I say that again? No shotgun wedded here. Marriage should be of your own free will. That a man and a woman found each other, and the scripture says real clearly that a man leaves his mama, right? He cut his apron string. And I'm telling you, it's a sad thing when a man can't cut his mama apron string. I'm just telling you straight up. And and that's how I talk to men, right? I talk to men a little different than I talk, talk to ladies. But men should be able to take it. They need, need a man up in this area of, of marriage. And, and a man leaves his mother and father and cleaves Right? He cleaves to his wife. But what does that look like to cleave to another person? To cleave to another human? What, is it, what does that look like? So, in the details of marriage, the man and the woman agree that they're going to stay exclusively together. Right? You agree. And then from that point, which is called engagement, and in Jewish time, engagement is the marriage. It's just not consummated yet. But it's marriage. So when you get engaged, you're married. And you come underneath the same uh, principles of God for marriage when you are engaged. You ain't going out. You ain't crowding with other women. You ain't crowding with your old boyfriend. You ain't crowding with your, your baby daddy. You ain't doing none of this stuff that you say, now we locked in. And there's a promise and the fulfillment of the promise. Come on, man. Ain't this God? And the fulfillment of the promise is going to happen in the future. That's like Christ and the church, that we get locked in with salvation, right? But there's a promise that one day there's going to be a consummation, a wedding day in the future, whether it's tomorrow when Christ comes back or 10,000 years. When Christ, there's a promise of the future. So in the middle, we are engaged to Jesus. We are engaged, which is married to him. So we, so we marry to what? His principles? His, his, his likes, we, we, people who hate him, we hate people who love him, who love him. And when I say hate, I don't mean humans. I'm talking about principalities, powers, and evil spirits, right? Because we're not going to hate our fellow man. Because our battle was not against flesh and blood. We know that. 
sometimes in marriage, you think the enemy is your husband, and he's not. And husbands, you think the enemy is your wife. You said, well, the enemy comes out of mouth. Well, it might. It might. But we're going to talk about that tonight in just a little. Because I'm not going to stay, stay long on the point. So you have this marriage, you have this union, and then what makes it powerful is that your marriage goes underneath a vow, the old up the vow, right? And I'm going to do extensive teaching on the vow. The vow is when you and your husband, you and your wife, pledge to each other. Now, it's not the engagement. The engagement was preliminary, just the beginning. And then that year of preparing for the wedding feast, right? You're preparing yourself. You're sanctifying yourself because both of you might not be virgins. Are you with me? You might you might not be virgin. You might have you might have multiple sexual partners before you got married, right? He kept it from you. You kept it from him. You ain't tell them all. You ain't tell them all, right? But you told most of them. You know what? No surprise, right? I can get an amen on that. And so, and so you have multiple sexual maybe. So during that year time, you're sanctifying yourself, right? Sanctify it, it's a fancy religious thing, thing. Separate yourself. Separate from your friends. Separate from your mama. Now that means you stop seeing them. I'm talking about the attachment. The attachment. Separate from old lovers. Separate from old girlfriends. You purge your phone book and your number. You might can't do it all at once because you're so attached in your soul. So you so you have a wedding day. And you begin to cut ties. Come on now. Are you with me? Are you with me? You begin to cut ties. At that time, if you marry a, a mother's boy, you begin to cut ties from his mama. Amen. Amen. You begin to cut the ties. Financially, emotionally. Behavior wise, you begin to cut and begin to stand up erect as a grown man underneath his own power, knowing that he's going to take a wife unto himself to create another branch. This is good, y'all. This is good, y'all. Because I know anybody explained this to you that the God wants you to create another branch. So you slip from the other branch, not him. But from your mama and your and your daddy and their dictate, and you come underneath the authority, and then now you come underneath the authority of God, and he becomes the king of both your lives. And then the wedding day comes. Come on now, man. This this is filled with the Holy Ghost. Then the wedding day comes, and then he comes down the aisle and he waits for you, and your daddy gives you up. In front of who? Everybody, his side and your side, your side and his side, and in front of the man of authority. Because in order for a wedding to take place, hear me, in order for a wedding to take place, and a wedding is a process, it's not just a day. Underneath authority, you pledge your vow. That's why you and your boy can go in the backyard have a daggone picnic if you don't have no authority you stand up in a daggone stoop in the back and pledge your love to that girl in front of your boy who ain't got no authority that's why you and your husband right is not married in the back of a pickup truck that when you was having no bedtime talk and he said i would never leave you and you're mine and you're all romantic after after having sex in the back of the truck or in the car yeah i just talked about the car and, and then y'all feel all gooey and he make this flesh to you. I love you all the rest of my life. But he didn't do it underneath authority. And actually the sex you was having was illegal. So it was not just not under authority. It was illegal in the eyes of God. Right? And so, so that don't count. That's not real. He said, piece of paper don't change. And let me tell you something about that piece of paper. You got a piece of paper to drive your car. Now you think about that. 
you got a piece of paper to drive your car, a car, inanimate object, and you get caught without that paper or that driver license, and if you do often enough, you can go to jail. But how come I bet that paper don't change nothing? Oh, yes, it does. That merit certificate makes it legally binding for property. Wait a minute. You see, I, see, I get excited about that stuff because that's just foolishness to me. That's just an excuse for a man who won't commit his life to a woman. That's just an excuse for a woman who won't commit legally so you stay in the gray area. And so you stand up that day on your wedding day, guys. You stand up that day in front of witnesses, right? You can even be the judge of the peace. But he's a man of authority. It could be a captain of a ship. He's a man of authority. And you stand up in front of authority, and then you make the vow. You said, look, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. God, you have given me this woman, and you make a declaration in front of your boys, your girls, your neighbors, the people who serve in dinner. You stand up there, man, like a grown man, like a grown man. And you stand up there, and you say, I have pledged my life and i'm going to take care of you and then y'all can work out the details of what that means for him to take care of you and but you make a vow too woman you said i make i'm going to take care of him yeah come on that's a wedding that's a wedding and people try to avoid it because they said the paper doesn't make no difference and that's a lie it does make a difference and then what happens since marriage is instituted by god and most people don't tell you, but there's something happened in spirit. Something happened in the spirit that when you declare your, your love, your, your honor, your protection over that woman, when you declare it and she make it back, something happened in the spirit. The vow, the vow is alive. It's not dead. It's a vow. Then the, the man underneath authority says, I heard your vow. And is it true? Say, this vow is true. Then you look at the girl. Is this vow true? And she said, no, this, this vow is true. You know, this Austin, he said, he said, now, now you can kiss the bride. Now, now you can take it unto yourself. Now you can go to the marriage bed chamber and consummate. Now is legal because you declare not only your love, but protection and your dedication from the witness underneath authority and spiritually something happened. And let me tell you right now, y'all, I don't care how long you live together. I don't care how long you live together. It don't happen. That spiritual bond don't happen. It's called adultery and it's all fornication. I'm trying to tell you. I'm trying to tell you that's what it is. Somebody just got to set the record straight. That's what it is. Now you two go off and you make your, your own branch. And that's marriage with the vow. And I found some really serious consequences. It's in the word of God. I'm not going to go over tonight. But I'm going to do the show. A show on the vow. Something crazy happens because marriage is spiritual when you break the vow. You can't break the vow. The vow is precious because the vow is a covenant, which means you split the pieces. When a man takes his penis and split the woman hymen, which is supposed to be a virgin, we know a lot didn't happen, but don't get bogged down in there. God got a way to cleanse that too. That's what the year of separation is for, guys. That's what the year of separation is for before you get married. And I'm saying the year, but this is no timeline. I'm just saying most people do the year. That's tradition. But it, don't, it don't have to be a year. It could be three months. It could be six weeks. Right? It's definitely not you meet her in Vegas and get married at night. I'm telling you that. Ain't that. So you separate, you cleanse yourself, man. You get rid of the filth and you get your mind in the game. You get your mind in the game. And during that time and engagement, you should be taking marriage counseling. Is anybody out here single? You should be taking marriage counseling. You should be under the feet of people who have gone before you so they can tell you what's up because people are entering into this, this vow, this covenant not having a clue of the death that is involved. Matter of fact, there's two. I'm, my tongue tied. 
is death and death. And that's marriage. There's a death, there's an odor to it. Because in marriage, you must die. You, you, you die to self. Now, in Christianity, you die to self. So your walk in Christianity, if you're single, is the same as if you're married. And the principles you use in marriage is the same principles used in your salvation, redemption, justification, holiness. It's the same. So we go back to my question. How can two Christians that got the Holy Ghost get divorced? And then the Lord told me a long time ago, then I worked out the pieces. One of them stopped dying to self. Or both of them. One of them stopped doing the principles of the Lord that gave him life in Jesus Christ. That's a fact. Somewhere along the line, they got tired of being saved. Somewhere along the line, they got tired of doing the principles that bring them joy and the intimacy of the Lord. And, it's, and then they begin to slowly move back. I want to show you this in scripture. Can I show you this in scripture? Your mind? I don't always do it, but I want to. There's so many scriptures tonight, and I'm not going through all of them. I've been yabbering for a half hour. That's that's the intro. I want to show. I want to show you that. I talked to you about marriage. Now I'm going to segue into the dissension of your sex life. Okay? Because y'all start off so y'all start off so hot. <laughs> Hot and ready, baby. I know. Because you're young, right? But now it's 10 years in, 15 years in, and your jets cool just a little. But some have cooled too much. And why this slow descent into a sexless listen to what I'm saying. Why this slow descent to a sexless marriage when your marriage started sexy and consummated at night? What happened? What happened? I can tell you this right now. What are the, what are the three? We're we going to learn this. Communication, sex, and money. Communication, sex, and money. Threefold cord is not easily broken. Communication, sex, money. You take away one of these, and your marriage is teetering. You take away two of them, and it's crashing. And it's crashing. In order to have a good sexual life, you got to communicate. In order to communicate, you got to have a good sexual life. In order to be good in finances, you got to communicate. And it ain't nothing like having money and good sex. <laughs> you need to write that down. Say, Elder Blaine said, there ain't nothing like having money and good set. That's a happy life. I'm a, and I'm a happy husband. So I know what I'm talking about. Let me go ahead and go to where we want to go. We want to go. We want to go. Psalms chapter one. I, I want I want you guys to go to the Psalms chapter one for me. Okay. Going on my iPad here. And I want to read I want to read this to you, okay? And I want to give you this revelation. And tell you what happened in your sex life. I mean, to hit it just a little. Talk about it about, I don't know. We will talk about it just a little bit. It says this in Psalms 1. And I want to tell you how sometimes we miss, sometimes we miss some of the juice from God because we read the Bible too fast. Try to get over it like a chore. But every word is from God. And if you take your time, God will speak to you. And I believe right now, God will speak to you. So write this down, or open your Bible, or open up your Bible app, and come with me as we, we do this. It says, Blessed is the man that walk not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinner, nor seateth in the seat of the scornful. And you said, what they got to do with marriage? All scripture is God breathed. All scripture is useful for rebuke, correction, 
and training in righteousness. All scripture. All scripture deals with the marriage of the Lamb. So your answer to your marriage is in the word. It's in scripture. Let's see what scripture is saying. It said, blesses the man. And we can use this man as mankind. And, and I want you to take your pen. I want you to circle a couple of words for me. He says, as walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, blessed is the man, a woman, that standeth not in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of the scornful. Listen here. Listen. Listen to what it's saying. There is a progression of non-movement here. If we look at the scripture. First, the man is walking. The female walking. Both of you are walking together. Then, there's the counsel of the ungodly. Then he says, nor standeth in the way. Now, this couple is walking. Now, this couple is not moving no more. Now, they standing. They was walking, now they standing, and then they say, nor seateth in the seat of the scornful, now they sitting. They was walking, hand in hand. Then they become immobilized, and they paralyzed, and then they no longer walking together, and they sitting. This is what happens in marriages. When two Christians or two couples, man and woman, decide not to follow the heat of God. It says, let's go back over. Blesses the marriage. It says man. Blesses the marriage. Blesses the marriage. That walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. The world, the enemy, hates your marriage. Hate you, hate your children, hate your husband. Once you have disease, they are bitter and they are jealous of the happiness you have on your wedding night that you married. And they say, oh, it's gonna, how long is that going to last? And so they begin to give you counsel. And God is calling it ungodly counsel. Because of ungodly counsel, you start walking and looking at each other. I know for a fact there's a wedding out there, a marriage out there, that part of the problem. What's part of it? What she got so inundated with the wives of Atlanta. I never seen the program, but I, I know it was about drama. And she took on the characteristics of those women on that. I, I know it's for a fact. And she brought that to her household. She brought that, that mentality and that view in her household. And she, I guess, she thought that she wasn't empowered. She had a happy wife. She had a happy life. She had good children, but she brought that stuff inside, and it began to taint her marriage and her, and her with her husband. Then it goes to standing in the way of sinners, no sitting in the way of the scornful. The dissension of sexual appetite in a marriage starts with counsel that's ungodly. That's where to start. Somebody said something and when you find out when you start talking to marriages like i have and talking to husbands and wives like i have and been about in the life you find out that in the midst of a torn marriage this ungodly counsel can i get an amen ungodly counsel and it's coming for somewhere they see it on tv and then they play a song over and over and over and over the R&B stuff. And I'm not coming against your r and I'm just saying it leads you in a certain type of mood, man. It, it leads you somewhere. Now, you can say it doesn't affect me. Then I'm not talking to you. But the combination of visual, Facebook, Instagram, wherever you're getting it from, Netflix, wherever you're getting it from, hanging out with the girls, beauty shop hanging out with the fellas at the gym, whatever it is, that counsel begin to swell around you and they begin to tell you, listen, listen, listen. They begin to tell you how to live, how to live in the flesh. See, the counsel 
of the ungodly would never tell you how to live in the spirit. And the Bible says, what is flesh is flesh, but what is spirit is spirit. Then it say, walk in the spirit, not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. So the secret to a delightful marriage is to walk in the spirit. Now, because now, now, you know, I deal with a lot of religious people. We, walking in the spirit is not going to church. That's not walking in the spirit, right? You go to church to learn how to walk in the spirit. And you go to church to learn to walk by faith. And this was his podcast all the way. This is the way of the Lord walking in it. But, but if you don't know how to walk in the spirit, and what I mean by that, I'm talking about practically. Practically. Like when I say walk in the spirit, if an image and a picture does not come to your mind that is godly, but that's an image a picture of you dressed in a nun's robe with a habit on your head, or you wearing a collar, or you got a shawl on, or you got skirts down to your ankle, and I say walk in the spirit, and that's the image that comes to your mind, you have been bamboozled. That is not what it means. Let's turn to, let's turn to, let me get my, my notes on this. It's right here. I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'm not going to read the whole thing. I just want to say is that Galatians chapter 5 deals with the law of the spirit and how to walk in the spirit. And if you want your marriage to increase tonight, tonight, you got to get the word in. And it's cheaper picking up a Bible than going to a therapist. And it's cheaper to keep your marriage together than getting divorced, pay alimony, and have somebody else raise their children. It's the easier thing to read the word of God and submit to it. And both of you submit to what God. You might not do it together, but you surely can revive yourself tonight and make another commitment to the Lord and say, you know what? I'm going to do God's word. And so Galatians chapter 5 talks about living in the body, the flesh of the body, be led of the spirit. And Galatians 5, 17 says, for the flesh lusteth after the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. These are contrary one to another, so you cannot do the things. This is what it says, that you cannot do the things that you would. And then in Galatians chapter 20, actually verse 19, he said, now the works of the flesh are manifest. I'm talking about marriage. A lot of times they kind of beat you up as a, as a single. I'm talking about marriage. He said, the works of the flesh are manifest. Then he gives you a list. These are adulteries. Do you have do you have a problem in your marriage? How many how many times a marriage got broken up with somebody having a side chick or a side cool boy? The first thing is adultery, fornication, uncleanness. How uncleanness can drive partners together. People don't have sex sometimes because the other person's too clean. Most of the time it's the husband coming home from work. His beard's all grizzly. He won't take a shower. He works on cars. He got oil underneath the thing. And the woman just sitting there going, Ugh. He thinks she don't want him to touch him. She does want to. Listen, son. She wants you to touch her, but you're just so dirty. You need to take a shower. You need to brush your teeth and floss. You need to use deodorant. You need to put a smell good on. Amen? The works of the flesh, lasciviousness. You know what lasciviousness is? Lasciviousness is a fancy word of saying you dress it in such a way to attract the attention of somebody else besides your partner. That's what lasciviousness is. That's you dressing. I'm doing it for my husband. Your husband ain't nowhere around. Matter of fact, you go out and you look a certain way, and then when he comes home, then you have to change your clothing and you put on your daggone battle fatigue. And then way up there, he can't see nothing. But the girls at work ain't got nothing on. I'm telling you, that's lasciviousness. And that breaks up chief friends. So you start off in the spirit. That's what Galatians is about. You start off in the spirit, both of you saying, 
we are going to do obey the word of God. And the proof of that is we got married. The proof of that we did a vow. But then ungodly counsel come in and begin to change your mind and twist and turn the very word of God. God wants you to be sexy. God wants you to have good relations with your husband or wife. God wants you to have good communication. But sex is part of marriage. You say, well, I'm tired. I, I'm too tired. But is it that you're really tired? Or are you tired the way that he approaches you? Is it is it that he, you tired, sir? Because it's, it's the other way around, too. I know somebody like that, too. Is, it, is, is your husband tired when did you approach him? Could it be that when he sees that you do things wrong, you don't admit it and it affects him? Could it be, young man, that your wife asks you to do something and you don't fulfill your promise on that thing and it taints your relationship? I know it's getting tough. I know this is getting tough right here. But, but it's only getting tough because the Holy Ghost is shining a searchlight on you because you want your marriage to get better. Well, the way to do it is through the word of God. And then obey the word of God. In the little things, man. Not no, it ain't no giant, ain't no giant theology going on here. It is submitting to God's principal wisdom. He says that this is the manifestation of the spirit. They contrary to one another. It goes through the whole list. You need to read that for yourself. Uh, Galatians chapter 5, 20. All you got to do is do your browser. You don't even got to have a, a Bible. All you got to do is hit your browser on your phone and put down Galatians 5, 20. Then read the verse above it, read the verse underneath it. And that gets you started. And then you say, is it me, oh God? <laughs> is it me? Is it me, oh God, standing in the need of prayer? I need help. And so when you are in the flesh, female, and you are in the flesh, Male, when you are both in the flesh, then the pride of your flesh will cause your marriage to crumple. And here you guys are walking down the aisle, but one day, the ungodly council, and all of a sudden, you're standing, and the next you know, you're sitting. You're in the same room, but two miles apart. Same thing with your sexual life. Here you was, running down the aisle together. Couldn't wait. You get into the bed. What changed? What changed? Yeah. One of you, both of you, got away from the principles of God. The Bible says, don't be unequally yoked. What do I mean by that? We said there's a lot of things. Didn't we? we said a Presbyterian could have married a Baptist, or a Baptist could have married a Catholic. That's how we did it. And we did it cardinally. This is unequally. You see, we go, listen. Then we're going to move on to finances. When one of the couple, husband or wife, decided to no longer follow the Lord in the area of walking by the Spirit, that's when trouble developed. Because if you walk by the Spirit, the Bible says, you would not fulfill the lust of the flesh. One of the lusts of the flesh, you know, it just want to be right all the time. Opinionated. Won't forgive. Hostile. For no reason at all. But if you live by the Spirit, then you live by the law of Christ Jesus in the Holy Ghost. And you have to work at it. And God will pinpoint each thing one at a time. Let's move on to finances because I'm not going to keep you long because I'm going. Marriage, sex, the answer is walk in the spirit. We will continue that at, at more podcasts. And I'm going to talk to you about it and get you trained in it. And so you can, so your marriage, oh, come on, man. Jesus, help me, Jesus. Help me. So your marriage be one of the spirit. And your marriage won't be one of the flesh. Because the day you eat from that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall surely die. But the day you eat from the tree of life, you shall live forever. Marriages die 
because they eat and partake from the knowledge of the tree, good and evil, which is the flesh. But when both of you eat of the tree, from the tree of life, your marriage lives. If one of you stop, stop eating from the tree of life, stop partaking from the tree of death and good, both of it's good. See, you, you, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So everybody said, that's evil, that's evil, that's evil. Yeah, but the good could kill your marriage too, man. Don't you see that? The good could kill your marriage too. You like blame that? It make no sense. Yes, because the good is not God. The good is not God. You working eighty hours is good. You working eighty hours and going back and forth and and, and driving your car back and forth is good, but it's killing your marriage, man. It's killing your relationship with your wife and your children. It's a good idea on paper, but your wife don't see you. Your kids don't see you. You can't go to the games. You can't go to the games, man. Your son don't see you there. You're not there with your daughter recital, but it's good. You, you're making money, but your family is dying. Now you're getting divorced. Now you get, where's the money at now? It was a good idea because somebody counts to you who don't understand the way of God, man. And they told you, man, don't let that opportunity pass. Go get that bag. Go get it. And then you run and get it. And when you come back with the bag, ain't nobody there. The house is empty. Your house is deserted because you went off down the road, man. And, you, and you're and you not listening. The good will kill your marriage just as much as the evil. I am crucified with Christ. Yet I no longer live. But not I. Marriage is death. Death to self. And the moment you start to live, your marriage stops. You got to be tenderhearted to both of you. You got to be forgiving, both of you. You got to be loving, both of you. You got to embrace one another, both of you. Well, I don't want to beat that to death. I'm just telling you. I'm just telling you. In the book of Solomon, Songs of Solomon, Songs of Solomon is by Jesus Christ. It's in the Bible. Solomon chapter 1, verse 1 through 5. All the way down to 14, and you read it. There's a scripture in chapter 1 that says, I lay my head between the breasts of my love. That's what it says in the word. I lay my head between her breasts. There's another scripture that I quote all the time, man, over my wife. And I said, uh, this one that said her breasts look like twin gazelles. And then it said, oh, yes, the other one I say is her breasts shall all be satisfied. I want you to think about this now as we move on. What position is the man when he laid his head between her breasts? That is an act of intimacy. When you make love and have sexual intimacy with your husband and your wife, it doesn't always have to be penetration. It could be, could not be. But in your marriage, and here's the nugget tonight that's sticking with me. If your goal is always that, the, that your being intimate is that act, then you're going to get shut down. And that's that's like a little boy. So you might want to ask your wife this. Honey, besides penetration, penal penetration, besides that, you might fix it up a little better than that, but I'm just cutting to the chase tonight, if you don't mind, if you don't mind. Besides that, what else would you consider intimacy that would feed you and show you that I love you? First off, you probably faint if you say anything. 
And she'd probably say, but not all. Well, sometimes just don't want to do that, but I do want you to hold me. Really? Just hold you? You be satisfied with that? Sometimes, she would say. She would look in your eyes and say, sometimes. Sometimes I will. If you go to the Song of Solomon, if you go to the Song of Solomon, it tells you to hold her. It tells you, your fat self, lay your head between the breasts. She might say, get off me, but you know what I mean. Act of intimacy. Into me, you see. Into me, you see. And fill your life with intimate moments, encapsulating the whole range of sexual activity. And you're going to find yourself walking together again and not standing or sitting at the seat of the storm. Amen. I think I'm good. And then and let's hit finances real quick because you spend your time with me here. Let's earn a little bit of money. Let's make a little bit of money. Amen. Let's make a little bit of money. If you like what I was talking about, just go ahead and give me some amens and some claps and some stars, and some subscriber and some encouragement. And I appreciate it. Let's talk about money. Let me give you, I tell you what, let me just give you a quick tip. And let's put money in your pocket tonight. Amen. Okay. So you stand there, you reach your pocket, and you ain't got no money. You know how much you're making, but you ain't got no money. And you're losing money. And so, in the realm of financial recovery, here's just a couple of tips, principles. I think we're going to do it like that tonight. tonight. People say they want to make more money. People say they need more money. That's going to eggs, $100. And um, so what can we do as a people? This is my first rule of thumb. When I find myself short cash, money coming in, the first thing the Lord taught me years ago was look for the leaks. Don't try to make more money because if you try to make more money at that time, you might end up spending more money than trying to make money. I'm not saying you can't make more money. I'm just saying that the first rule that I do is I look for the leaks. Somewhere, your funds are leaking out. And then you take your time and your energy to plug the leaks. For instance, one of the leaks that I found out that we do is subscription that we do from being online. That's a leak. And I bet you, and I'm a gambling man, I'm just say, I'm quite sure that if you do this one, I'm about to tell you, you're gonna find some lost money. You go and you get on your phone, you get your iPhone, my iPhone got the, the, the camera in it, so I can't do it. But you go on your iPad, right? Go to your Apple setting, if you got an iPad or that, you go to Android setting, and you go to Amazon, and you go in there and you look underneath subscription. And you think you cancel or your subscription. And the other day, I got me a renewable thing. And you know what I had on my And you might want to check this out. That during the pandemic, I subscribed to Zoom. Y'all remember that? I subscribed to Zoom. And then after the pandemic, I got like off Zoom. I'm on Facebook Live. And I still had a subscription. And they charged me $149, man. I wasn't even using Zoom for a year. And it came with renewable. And I normally catch stuff like that, but it caught me. So what I do is every month, scrolling on my phone, I hit subscription. You do that tonight. I hit subscription, and I see that I'm paying for all these little apps that got renewable funds on them, and they're filtering your money. Four ninety nine here, fifteen dollars here, sixteen over here, hundred forty nine and Zoom. Over there, and they pilfering your money. You got a budget in your mind, and all of a sudden, that renewable fee come up there, takes your money, and now if you don't have draft protection, now you got an extra thirty nine dollars. 
that's one thing to take care that, that you got to watch out for. So you got to watch out for the subscription. Second thing is, I go to the bank at least three times a year, easy. And I don't go through the drive through I don't go through the drive through I go in the bank. And I sit down and I say, can you please print me off a list of all reoccurring fees? And I go, okay, that's my iTunes. Yeah, I still want that. Oh, what's that right there? I don't want that. I don't want that. And of course, I don't tell the banker. I just look at it and then I call them up and I get rid of recurring fees. So tonight's tip is get rid of recurring fees. And that's my pleasure to tell you that. The other tip is, as far as finance is concerned, and I know you heard it before, but I don't keep reiterating it so you can hear me clear because I believe this is a lure for some of you up here. Do not spend more than you make. That's hard to do because of the, of the addiction. And I know we're going to talk about addiction on the podcast. It's hard to do. But do not spend more than you make. Do not. Don't do that. Okay? Because that's going to get you in the hole. Amen. But that's an hour. That's good. Hey, I started a, a, a Twitch. I'm on Twitch now. So I don't know what I'm doing on Twitch. So I got to take some courses. Yeah, this is a course. How to go on Twitch streaming. They do gaming. But I'm going there and declare the word of God. Here's my offer tonight. Is I wrote this book called Prophetic Worship. Prophetic worship is the way to communicate with God on a two-way street. And that we get away from just talking to God and not listen. Prophetic worship reminds us, and you can find this on Amazon. And I know that people use that to stimulate the worship experience, to get back on track from God, because I believe God has an answer for your life. But prophetic worship deals with not only you talking to God, communication, but you have an intimacy with God, and he's talking back to you, and you pausing enough in your life so God can talk to you, which means that you have to change your morning routine, which means that you have to get up early enough, Psalm 63, early enough to talk to God and then wait on God for God to talk to you. And yes, you can talk to him in your car. Yes, you can talk to him in stuck in traffic. But there's nothing like having a discipline in your life that you meet with him. You want to get this book in your hand. You want to read about Epic for Eight. You want to read about the different ways of worship. You want to read about the different ways to express yourself to God. Singing is one of them. Yes. And everybody loves to sing, right? But it talks about the supernatural exchange. Talk about spiritual warfare. We'll be talking about marriage. Talk about the Epe Corrego, the Choreographer who sits above, which is the Holy Ghost. We talk about prophetic worship and a priestly life. But we talk about forms of worship, uh, using the body, using the mouth, using implements like flags. And we're talking about the menstrual ministry. The menstrual ministry is when you take a guitar and you begin to stroke an instrument or your organ. That even though you might not play, and that you change the atmosphere in your home. And that you become a vessel that worship under God. And that it may change, listen, your spiritual health. So that you and your husband can walk in the rhythm and the patterns of God. That you give yourself over to worship. And you give yourself over to prayer. So God can decree over your life. And my house shall be. A house of worship, and my house shall be a house of prayer. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the night. I thank you for your intent to prosper your people in the things and the ways of God. I pray, Father, for maturity in marriage. I pray for marriages that have lost the way, that was walking, then standing, 
Now they're sitting across from the lawyer. I pray for a revival of spiritual interest and that each one of them will, will make a declaration to learn to walk in the spirit and to walk by faith and not by sight. And this is the beginning of the unraveling of the knot of the evil persuasion and ungodly counsel that has affected their marriage. I pray for a spiritual breakthrough. Communication wise, they would talk to one another, not scorn one another. That they would love each other, God, with tenderness and affection. And that financially they be stable and they will not spend more than they make. I pray this over the lives in the name of Jesus. Pray this, y'all. God bless you. God bless you. Like and subscribe. Be tender to one another. And remember that it is the graphic word of God that is able to save our souls. Good evening. And I'll talk to you later.